artificial intelligence has been through a number of ups and downs through the years. Periods of boom typically called an AI spring, followed by years of bust aptly called AI winter. These cycles started in the 1950s following the invention of the perceptron, which is of course the foundational unit of modern neural networks. The explosion of research that followed generated massive amounts of hype, leading many to believe that by the 1980s, computers would exceed human intelligence in many areas. Of course, that didn't happen. By the mid to late 1970s, winter had come. Funding dried up and research slowed to a crawl. The cycle progressed, and by the 1980s, we saw the rise of so-called expert systems. A rush of optimism ensued at the discovery of a new approach to artificial intelligence. Expert systems worked by the application of large sets of rules for problem solving. These rules were chosen by humans, often subject matter experts, that were operating of their own intuition and prior experience. It's not hard to see the end result, a brittle AI that can't generalize to examples beyond its training set. It didn't take long, just a few short years, for this to become apparent and for a new winter to set in. By the 1990s and early 2000s, machine learning had entered the fray as the latest attempt at artificial intelligence. Now this approach is statistical in nature and doesn't take many cues from biology or neuroscience. Machine learning remains popular today because it works quite well, though it is not widely considered to be an approach to developing artificial general intelligence. The 2010s saw the rise of deep learning, which is our current paradigm. Multi-layer neural networks are almost magical in their ability to tease out correlations in large amounts of data, and the early optimists can be forgiven for thinking that we had finally found a reasonable path towards an AGI. But by now, we've started to see some problems with this narrative. While deep learning is insanely successful, it has fallen short of some of its most optimistic predictions. Self-driving cars, which many claim to be on the roads en masse by 2020, are still years away. Now, this in and of itself isn't indicative of a shortcoming in deep learning, but some of the failure mechanisms are. As of those of us that have even dabbled in deep learning know, these models can be quite brittle. The brittleness of deep learning, in some respects, mimics that of the expert systems of the 1980s. Deep learning algorithms can manage to find solutions to the training data that maximize their training accuracy, but when deployed in the real world, they can fail in some strange ways. Perhaps the most strange of all is the use of adversarial attacks. These are slight modifications to input data that confuse the neural network into producing incorrect outputs. These changes wouldn't even phase a human being, and so it's somewhat perplexing that computers fall to them so easily. For example, in early 2020, Tesla's self-driving system was tricked into thinking a 35 mile per hour speed limit sign was an 85 mile per hour sign with a small piece of tape. Now, this wasn't done by connecting the top and the bottom of the three to make it look like an eight. That could certainly fool even a human, and so it wouldn't be surprising if it fooled a self-driving car. No, the researchers put the piece of tape horizontally so it extended the middle part of the three. To a human, it's still clearly a three, yet the neural network perceives it as an eight. This is just one example from a whole new class of research, but the bottom line is that it shows that neural networks don't understand in the way a human does. It's not all doom and gloom though. We have new technologies that show significant promise for deep learning. Transformer architectures, the perceiver model, self-supervised learning, and deep reinforcement learning are all open-ended paths towards a more general model of artificial intelligence. Whether or not these new technologies prove to be a route towards the holy grail and AGI remains to be seen, but if we take a look at past failures, we start to see some patterns emerge. These patterns are discussed in the paper Why AI is Harder Than We Think by Melanie Mitchell. She breaks down the issue into four separate fallacies that seem to plague artificial intelligence research. Let's take a look at what she has to say and I'll save my own commentary for the end. The first fallacy is the idea that narrow intelligence is on a continuum with general intelligence. This really boils down to the belief that the human brain is a sort of computational device and any other computational device that can reproduce some functionality of our brain is a step along the path from that narrow intelligence to our own general intelligence. No matter how trivial the task we emulate, that counts as progress. As the author quotes Stuart Dreyfus, it's like claiming that the first monkey to climb a tree made progress towards landing on the moon. 
As the author points out, one of the primary factors missing in this continuum from narrow to general intelligence is common sense. I can forgive the computers for this one, as so many humans lack common sense as well, but I digress. The second fallacy is that easy things are easy and hard things are hard. We would assume that problems that are hard for humans, like say calculating high order differential equations, are intrinsically hard. In fact, they're trivial for computers without even using neural networks. Anybody that has used Mathematica knows that the computer can solve equations infinitely faster than a person. And yet easy things like walking down the sidewalk in the snow are all but impossible for even the smartest computers. The reason is pretty straightforward. The human brain is the end result of a billion years of evolution. Selective pressures have generated a bit of tissue that can perform seemingly impossible computations in a fraction of a second without any conscious awareness. Everything we do on top of that that we consider rational thought is just the tip of that large subconscious iceberg. Under the surface, our subconscious mind is receiving, filtering, and processing an enormous amount of data. Sights, sounds, smells, all of our sensory input is constantly streaming into the brain. We're not even aware of the majority of it to the extent that we can totally zone out on long car trips and lose track of time. It was only with the explosion of deep learning that these subconscious perceptual processes were taken seriously. They were all but ignored during the expert system and symbolic computing years. It's at least a step in the right direction that modern AI research is concerned with speech and vision. The third fallacy is the idea of wishful mnemonics. This is the concept that the very language we use to describe artificial intelligence systems engages in anthropomorphic reasoning. So for instance, we'll often refer to the goal of a reinforcement learning agent. Now a goal is an outcome that is pursued by a conscious actor. In reality, all the reinforcement learning agent is doing is attempting to maximize some objective function. It has no conscious awareness that it's trying to beat a game, or really any awareness of anything at all. Now, this isn't a huge problem for researchers, as the author points out. You and I know that a deep learning agent doesn't have a goal. It's just a neural network that's approximating the action value function in some game, and then uses epsilon greedy action selection as a policy. Fair enough. The author argues that the problem comes in with communication with the public. Such language can be a little misleading to those who don't really think about these things and convey a state of advancement of the field that isn't entirely accurate. The final fallacy is perhaps the most interesting of all. It is the assertion that intelligence is all in the brain and that the body itself is relevant. This is the belief that the brain is a squishy computer turning inputs into outputs. The body only serves as a mechanism for interacting with the environment, providing those inputs, and enacting the output instructions, and has no real part to play in the cognitive process. The logical conclusion of this train of thought is that we can upload our minds to a machine and everything will be A-OK. -okay. Indeed, this belief is represented in the modern state of the art. A deep neural network is kind of like a brain in a jar, totally disembodied. I suppose one could argue that robotic systems and self-driving cars do, in fact, have some sort of perceptual input, and that's kind of true, but there isn't a huge amount of interplay between the physical interaction and the quote-unquote intelligence of the deep neural network. This belief implies that the solution to artificial intelligence is to just bolt on more computing power and some matching software, or just one big supercomputer and some fancy algorithm away from a superintelligent AI that can solve all our problems. But is that really the case? Some researchers are calling this into question. The alternative idea is that of embodied cognition. Essentially, how we think is inextricably linked to our physical bodies. There is no truly abstract thought. Emotion, action, and perception are all essential to cognition. Apparently, this idea has some basis in neuroscience. The brain structures that control cognition are linked to the structures that control sensory and motor functions in the brain. There's growing research that indicates that all of our so-called abstract concepts are actually rooted in body-based internal modes. Related to this idea is that emotion is irrelevant to the cognitive process. Nowhere is this more apparent than in the thought experiment of the paperclip maximizing superintelligence. If you're not familiar with it, it's a thought experiment where the idea is that we give an artificial superintelligence the objective of maximizing paperclip production. It raises the entire earth for resources to make paper clips, killing all life in the process. This brings us back to the idea of common sense. The author questions whether or not such a system could exist without common sense. 
Clearly, its creators wouldn't want the paperclip maximizer to kill all life on Earth, and any super intelligent being should be able to figure that out. It remains to be seen that we can separate emotion, physical embodiment, sense of self, common sense, and autonomy from intelligence. So what do I think of all of this? Well, for my part, I think these are some reasonable criticisms, though I don't completely agree. I would say that the wishful mnemonics fallacy is reaching a little, given that the public at large is scientifically illiterate, and scientific communication in general is quite poor. The public's overestimation of the state of progress of a field doesn't hamper the quality of research in that field in just about any other discipline, so I don't think it really holds back progress in AI research. As far as the continuum from narrow to general intelligence fallacy, I would largely agree. It's generally assumed that there is a continuum for intelligence, but I don't think even our everyday experience bears that out. A human being isn't just a smarter cockroach. We're not even really a smarter primate. There is something fundamentally different about the way we think relative to other animals. I suppose a counter-argument would be that we can teach some apes sign language and dogs can come to understand our language, but that's a far cry from discovering special relativity or building a rocket to the moon. I think it's reasonable to assert that a machine intelligence, however that ultimately works, would be even further removed from human intelligence than we are from a cockroach intelligence. It shares no common evolutionary path and doesn't even run on the same substrate. So I think it's probably not accurate to think that narrow intelligence lies on a spectrum with general intelligence. Now, of course, I certainly could be wrong, but it seems like an assumption to me rather than a statement of fact. Which makes me think, one thing we're missing in all of this discussion is a rigorous definition of intelligence. I think most people take the perspective that we would recognize an artificial general intelligence if we saw one, and indeed that might be the case, but it doesn't really help us in designing one. What is it exactly that we're trying to design? What is the bare minimum requirement for it to work? I think this is one area the author of this paper could have explored a little bit, as I don't see it really addressed in the popular literature. Now, one area where I'm sort of in agreement, but not really, is the idea of cognition in the absence of all the other hardware of a physical body. I think AI researchers ultimately ignore it because it isn't well understood in neuroscience, and you can't really model something you don't understand. I think once there's a stronger understanding of how emotion and proprioception play into cognition, we'll start to see the leading AI researchers incorporate that into their research. But even still, I'm not convinced that deep learning is the path towards AGI. The reason is pretty simple. The physical principles underlying how an airplane flies and how a bird flies are pretty much the same. Lift, drag, thrust, all that kind of stuff. Yet the operation of an airplane only superficially resembles that of a bird. AI research, at least deep learning, has taken the approach of trying to engineer artificial intelligence by mimicking the underlying wetware of human cognition. Now this isn't stupid, but probably misses the mark just as a hang glider misses the mark of powered flight. You can certainly get somewhere in a hang glider, but you're not going to cross the ocean. What I think is missing is a first principles approach to intelligence, starting with a proper mathematical definition. From what little I know of it, Integrated Information Theory attempts to address this, though I don't think they've had a huge amount of success in pursuing an AGI. Armed with a proper definition, we could really start to think of a first principles approach to artificial intelligence. It will almost certainly be a system that processes and retains information, but in a way that is appropriate to a silicon substrate rather than a neurological one. In the end, it will probably have some superficial similarity to human cognition, but just like an airplane versus a bird, the engineering will be totally different. That's all I've got for now. If you like the content, make sure to leave a like, subscribe for future videos, and hit the bell icon so you get notified. I'll see you in the next video.